Okay, good morning everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for the second day of our third annual Global Conference on Energy Efficiency here at the IEA. We are very pleased to welcome you all, and particularly ministers, ambassadors, special guests. We are very gratified that you are all willing to come and join us and spend the time today discussing this very important topic of energy efficiency. For those of you who were here yesterday, I just repeat a couple of announcements in terms of the conference. First of all, if there is any need to evacuate the room, please proceed uh, in an orderly manner to the doors you came and out to the main doors on the left, uh, out into the front of the venue. Also, we are trying to improve the environmental footprint of this conference in two ways. First of all, we are keeping it as close as we can, paper-free and plastic-free. So we have not printed agendas and biographies and things like that, but they're all available fully on our conference app. So if you wish to download the conference app, there are details just outside the door uh, of how you can do that. And also, yesterday, people used the app in a very interactive way to ask each other questions. We had some online polls, and we'll do some of that today. So the app is an opportunity not just to check the agenda, but also to connect with colleagues and to continue the conversation, uh, as well as what we'll hear from the stage. Secondly, we are also going plastic-free, so you'll have noticed that outside the door, we have a new type of plastic-free water bottle for you all. Uh, it's made of vegetable cellulose, it's reusable and it's fully compostable. So do please try and keep your bottle and it's available to be refilled during the course of the day. So other than that, I do hope you have a very pleasant day. We have a lot of really excellent speakers for you across the co course of the day. We do want to hear from you all during the coffee breaks to continue the discussions and to participate in, I think, what will be a very fascinating day for energy efficiency and for all of us. So without further ado, please let me introduce you to the Executive Director of the IEA, Dr. Fadi Burrell. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear uh, ministers, ambassadors, uh, dear colleagues, a very good morning to all of you. Welcome to our third global uh, conference on energy efficiency. This is the third time that we are organizing this event, and uh, Brian, our energy efficiency guru, tells me that this is the largest ever with the highest level of participation. We have uh, about 60 countries uh, around the world, and between them, uh, they represent over 80% of global energy use. We are so happy to see that many ministers, executives of uh, energy industry, ambassadors, energy efficiency experts, academia, they positively responded to our invitation. And this enthusiasm, we believe, is a very good sign for energy efficiency in general. I would like to thank all of those colleagues, to our ministers, uh, the CEOs, and others coming to our meeting, especially those colleagues who come from long distances from China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, US, Canada, Mexico, Japan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, uh, Minister, Latin America, Russia, and the Caspian uh, uh, countries. This conference, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is our third uh, conference, and just a few days before this conference, we released our annual energy efficiency market report. And this report is a special one which came out with the, work, with the World Energy Outlook team. I tell you, we did something uh, uh, here for this report for the first time. We ask ourselves the following question. If the countries of the world would deploy all the cost-effective energy efficiency policies gradually in the next 20 years without discovering new technologies, just with the existing policies, existing technologies, 
but the right energy efficiency policies, which are all cost effective. What happens? Everything else being equal, renewables, oil, coal, gas, nuclear being equal, but the countries use the, deploy the energy efficiency policies in the transportation sector, air conditioners, industry sector. What will be the result? How the global energy and environmental trends will be affected from that? The result, which we call it efficient world scenario, efficient world, the result is, in my view, very striking. What happens is that the households, the consumers, in an efficient world scenario, are better off globally about half a trillion US dollar, 500 billion. Just deploying the right energy efficiency policies. For example, India, we have colleagues from India. India is today uh, dealing with, trying to deal, like many energy important countries, high oil import bills. India's financial deficit will be much less. Air pollution in emerging countries and as a result of the deaths in emerging countries would be halved. And global CO2 emissions, which are in an increasing trend, will be remaining flat and even declining slightly. This is only, this is as a only and only as a result of deploying existing energy efficiency policies, getting the best practice from country A to apply to country B in the absence of discovering new technologies. This shows the power of energy efficiency uh, policies and this is the uh, very reason we make this analysis country by country, sector by sector, and we call it the, our efficient work strategy and our work is based on realization of deployment of those energy efficiency policies, households, transportation, industry, and uh, elsewhere. Now, I understood that the yesterday's meetings, uh, several uh, this meeting and the, the site uh, meetings here, focus on uh, three areas. One, the exchange of good best practices between the countries. This is number one. Number two, which we think is uh, also uh, very important, to build capacities, especially emerging countries, to make better energy efficient decisions, especially mid-level policymakers. This is the second issue, capacity building. And third, the need for mobilizing investments for energy efficiency policies. And in that context, on behalf of the International Energy Agency, I would like to convey you three messages, three announcements, uh, I should say, what we are doing and what we are going to do. Number one announcement, focusing on the best practice exchange, we are launching today, you will see across the foyer, a new global exchange platform for energy efficiency. It is a web portal, a major web, web resource that allows public to find out what energy efficiency policies used in different countries. For example, Japanese air conditioners. What is the energy efficient standard there? How the legislation is made? Who is monitoring this? And what are the impacts of it on the electricity consumption? Or the Canadian heating boiler efficiency standards or European
fuel efficiency, EU fuel efficiency standards. How these standards, norms and regulations are put together and how the legislation is drafted, which authorities are uh, following it, and what are the good and be, uh, bad lessons to learn. It will be in a web portal. Anybody who is interested, it can be a, 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 a household person, it can be an energy expert, it can be a minister, it can be a journalist. It is free for everybody. We are today launching this web portal. I would like to invite uh, all of you uh, this new uh, web portal uh, to visit. It is a part of our IES new modernized uh, website and being demonstrated at the, across the foyer. This is our first announcement and we hope that you will all look at it and I hope many of you will find it uh, useful. Second announcement. The work we are uh, doing and again exchanging of best practices and capacity building and training. We think this is a very important part of the work because analysis is good, we make, but we want to have seeing this analysis turn in the policy action. And who will do it? Who will do it? The, the policy makers, especially in the emerging countries. Since more than three years now, we are organizing capacity training and energy efficiency in all the sectors. And this year, we have celebrated 1,000 participants to our efficiency training uh, practices. Please do not underestimate the importance of that. This has a direct impact on the real life. If somebody comes from country A as a participant, learns the experiences from uh, a participant B on the legislation on the refrigerator efficiency, it is better to read lots of, uh, or easier to read lots of books and documents and uh, learn from it. And we have done uh, 1,000 people went through this capacity intensive training courses. Recently courses have taken place in Brazil, Singapore, in Indonesia, in Jakarta, and a few weeks of time in New Delhi, in India, one-to-one -one capacity training there. And I am pleased to inform you that uh, tomorrow I will travel to Singapore to participate in the ASEAN Energy Ministers Meeting. And we are very proud to working with those countries, very important part of the uh, world, including our uh, associate members of the IES, such as Indonesia, Thailand, and Singapore, many others. And we expect that IEA will be formally asked by the ASEAN uh, ministers how to improve the efficiency on the air conditions, a topic we have identified as one of the blind spots of uh, uh, energy work today, and we recently made a, uh, a study on that, Brian and uh, his team. So this is the second announcement, continuation, acceleration of our capacity training to deploy policies uh, in uh, on the ground. Third and the last announcement uh, we have is on finance. Uh, many of you know that to have the right policies for the governments, it is not enough. We need to increase investments uh, uh, for energy efficiency uh, action. This comes from also our, again, efficient uh, world strategy and our recently published World Energy Investment Report highlighted this issue. So in that context, I wanted to announce you uh, that a, a few weeks ago I was in Luxembourg and I had a meeting uh, with the President of uh, European Investment Bank, uh, Mr. Hoya, and uh, with uh, Mr. Hoya we have decided that we are going to jointly convene the leaders of the world's major international financial institutions to discuss how to harmonize and increase the investment in energy efficiency. We would like to organize this global dialogue 
to uh, how to accelerate the mobilization of investment for energy efficiency efforts uh, in Paris together uh, with the uh, European Investment Bank, but we will invite all the international financial institutions to learn from each other again and how we can mobilize more money for the energy in uh, efficiency investments. And I am pleased that the Vice President of the EIB, uh, Mr. Uh, Andrew McDonald, is with us here today. He will be speaking in the uh, next uh, session and he can give us uh, more uh, information on that. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can see from this meeting, from our web program, from the announcements I made, the building a web portal for everybody for the best practice on energy efficiency, increasing, putting a lot of resources on uh, capacity training across the world, and also pushing the money flows in the direction of energy efficiency investment shows how serious we are at the IEA and how much important it is for us to put the energy efficiency at the top of the international uh, energy policy making agenda for the uh, leaders. We believe, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there are many countries, almost 200 countries in the world, some of them are lucky to have oil resources, gas resources, renewable resources. Some of them do not have those energy resources. But all the countries in the world have energy efficiency resources and the potential. And we believe it is the IEA's work to make the most of these resources and to lead the international energy debate here. And I want to thank you very much for being here and helping the IEA to fulfill this very important task. Thank you very much and welcome to IEA once again. Thank you. So, uh, we have a, a few sessions today, but we wanted to start the, uh, our meeting from a government perspective. What do the, uh, our uh, governments around the world think about energy efficiency? What is the importance of energy efficiency for their uh, uh, public policies? Uh, what is their uh, thinking? And we have a very strong uh, first session here. And I would like to start uh, uh, with the, uh, Mr. Kimo uh, Tilikainen, who is the Finnish Minister of Environment, Energy and uh, Housing, a very active uh, Minister for Energy and Environmental Issues. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister, for uh, coming to our meeting. Uh, can you please join uh, uh, me to thank uh, Mr. Minister for coming here and giving us uh, his uh, views. Mr. Minister, thank you very much. Thank you, Fatih, and good morning, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It's really an honor to uh, address this audience today and uh, discuss some energy efficiency issues. Actually, the energy efficiency work done by IEA recently has focused in very good question. The question, what works well in energy efficiency and what doesn't work that well in energy efficiency. These are uh, lessons that we need to learn and these are items that uh, we can discuss and change our experiences. So, uh, to start with, I would like to uh, remind of the importance of energy efficiency because that's the, I guess, one of the most effective way to tackle the climate change. We need to uh, avoid um, in, uh, unnecessary uh, consumption of energy in all uh, parts of the, uh, I would say, production line of the system. In energy production, for example, combined heat and power is very energy efficiency, efficient way to produce heat and electricity. We need that kind of solutions. In transmission and, um, uh, of energy, no matter if it's electricity or heat or whatever, 
it's uh, very important that the transmission and uh, distribution system works in an efficient way. And then in the consumer side, why to lose energy for nothing? It's very important to improve energy efficiency in that side, consuming energy when it's really needed and to avoid uh, unnecessary um, uh, consumption. From the Finnish perspective, I would like uh, now focus on two special, uh, special issues. First, voluntary agreements agreed between our government and, for example, industries and companies. And then another issue is what kind of uh, energy efficiency tools smart energy system can offer us uh, in future. But uh, from the historic point of view, I would say that the voluntary agreements in combination with the auditing system combined with it, it has worked very well in Finland. Voluntary doesn't mean that you are totally free of any requirements or application, but uh, I think uh, that many actors are really willing to do things if they can agree on that, that they don't feel that they are pushed to do something, but they can voluntarily go to the right direction. Uh, however, agreements and auditing don't deliver results right away. Finland has used these with very good performance since mid-90s, so more than 20, 25 years now. And uh, now we can say, after a couple of decades, that they work and deliver remarkable results. With agreements, we use a small carrot uh, for the actors. Uh, one small carrot is that uh, if they are doing some investment, for example, that uh, government can give some uh, investment aid, they can be uh, supported with little higher percentage when they have these energy efficiency agreements in place. But the bigger carrot and benefit is um, the fact that with the agreement system and good reporting system um, uh, connected to that, the government and the agreement parties, they truly deliver energy efficiency measures and it's worth money. It saves costs for uh, everyone um, that is committed to these agreements. And uh, moreover, the agreement parties, like big industrial players, know that um, when they fulfill the requirement of these agreements adequately, that's not enough. So when they are committed and when they uh, truly deliver, uh, they won't be any additional, um, additional uh, measures that it could be little more difficult for them. So uh, that gives the uh, good commitment and the results are very impressive. Uh, the improvements of energy efficiency, uh, we would say that it has been more than 20% for example during the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Sometimes it's difficult to measure but anyway the remarkable uh, uh, impressive results are achieved so far. That's good. Then I would like to move to the future and the digitalization and energy efficiency and what kind of uh, opportunities smart energy system can offer. I know that myself and colleague Renner will definitely also discuss on this issue, but uh, uh, from uh, some, some words about the Finnish experiences. Finland has been one of the pioneers in smart meters in electricity. And we are also a producer of these uh, meters. First legislation was put in place in 2009 and by end of 2013, so five years ago, virtually all electric meters were remotely read smart meters. Therefore, we have had uh, for several years uh, then and now we know what smart meters can deliver and what they can't deliver yet. I can say that definitely this is the way to go uh, forward in digital future. These meters will deliver multiple benefits for consumers, distribution companies and energy sellers. But they are not the silver bullet that would make consumers smart by instant. 
the whole energy system must be turned smarter, not only the meters. And that doesn't happen very quickly. It takes time. It takes research and development and innovations, all of them are needed before the whole energy system has built up capacity to evolve and absorb new solutions. Uh, by saying this, I don't want to give pessimistic view of this, but rather urge you to move on, take soon the necessary steps, take the first steps and then continue walk. I would say that it's constant walk, the, um, the uh, implementing the smart energy system. I give some example how we are going to take next steps in Finland, progress further on smart energy. In spring 2021, Finland will take into use centralized data hub for electricity market data, including measures from all smart meters, and it will be next major step to digitalize of the electricity market. In December 2020, all Nordic countries will move from one hour to 15 minute periods in power stock. Big players follow immediately and smaller ones later with rollout of smart meters 2.1, so second generation of smart meters. With them, they are capable to measure 15 minute intervals for latest smart meters and it takes only remotely run software update to adjust them for that, to start measuring quarter hours. And then another point uh, or example of the uh, consumer's activity, already uh, 20,000 of electric heated households are pulled into demand response load in Finland at the moment. And more and more will um, join that and it will be increasing role in market-based uh, uh, electricity. Uh, uh, consumption uh, or demand, uh, uh, demand flexibilities. And then similar pilots are starting at the moment with electric vehicles. So we try to involve huge number of consumers rather quickly to join to the smart energy system so that uh, they, can, um, they can adjust, they can, uh, uh, adjust their uh, consumption according to the uh, supply and according to the price of electricity and so on and so on. And creating this smart energy system uh, makes all this possible. These are just a couple of examples of the constant improvement that is uh, needed in the future. The technology development is needed, of course, but much can be done already with existing robust technology. In addition, the most crucial part in the chain the human person must be educated, enlightened, guided, and supported to do wise choices, and by his choices, support energy efficiency measures in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister, uh, especially for highlighting the, the critical importance of uh, designing smart energy systems and the uh, possible implications for the energy efficiency improvements. So uh, from uh, Finland, we move to a close neighbor, to uh, uh, Estonia, and uh, the, the minister, uh, 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 Tamist is the minister for entrepreneurship and information technology, a country which where the digitalization is written by uh, capital letters. So Mr. Minister, we would like to hear you. Mr. Minister. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank the uh, International Energy Agency for organizing the conference on such an important topic as uh, energy efficiency. As a minister uh, responsible for housing in Estonia, I would like to give you a brief uh, overview of the steps we have taken to innovate uh, the building sector in our country with the objective to improve the energy efficiency for buildings. I'll bring you four uh, concrete examples. If we would uh, build a car in a similar way as we build houses today, it would look uh, something like um, this. 
we would take the engine from uh, BMW, gearbox uh, from Toyota, body from uh, Kia, and uh, assemble the whole product uh, without um, much knowledge uh, on how to uh, affect the final outcome. So, uh, who would like to drive this car? <laughs> Not many hands rising. So, uh, to introduce innovation and uh, maximize uh, energy efficiency gains, um, we have uh, started developing in Estonia our e-construction platform, an open data exchange platform uh, for improving the process uh, of planning, design, construction and maintenance of built assets. So what will this uh, e-construction platform uh, do? It will bring together data from different public registries to create a digital twin of the built environment. It will uh, improve communication between stakeholders throughout the building life cycle. This means the reuse of data and uh, now double work. It will provide user-centric public and uh, private services for built assets from a single point of entry so-called App Store for, uh, for built assets. It would also enable open access to vast amounts of data. This will encourage the development of uh, new services and business models that take the advantage of uh, big data, IoT and AI. We view uh, a building as a whole. The requirements are not broken into parts. This uh, solution grants the architects and designers a wide selection of options and encourages the use of uh, innovative solutions. Now a few words uh, about the move towards uh, nearly zero energy buildings. The adoption of in energy performance uh, of buildings directive in 2010 set us on a path to strive for nearly zero energy buildings. The biggest effect of the energy performance requirement can be seen in the building and housing sector of course. It will be transformed for the better, providing solutions that are both environmentally sustainable and economically cost-optimal. In Estonia, we have de developed our energy efficiency of buildings regulation in a way that would guide the industry forward while giving ample room for innovation. An example, this year a student dormitory of the Taltec University was renovated to a nearly zero energy building level. The walls and the roof are covered with insulation elements with integrate, integrated ventilation ducts. These elements were pre-built in a factory. In uh, theory, it should be possible to limit the on-site work for a couple of days using uh, this solution. Uh, in this case, it took a bit longer. But this was a pilot pro project. Since the final building achieved uh, new, nearly zero energy building level, it certainly showed that this solution has great potential for the future when we are looking at the possible options how to tackle the existing building stock. Third example, uh, Energy per uh, Performance Certificates database. Energy Performance Certificates have been a great tool to put the matter of energy um, efficiency into context for the end consumers. Before 2013, the EPCs were issued on paper in Estonia. Those uh, EPCs are still probably in the bottom of some drawer, meaning this uh, information was uh, not gathered in a holistic way and was uh, not applied in a useful way. In 2013, we launched EPC database. We used this opportunity to push forward to innovate, making uh, the EPC process completely paperless. Our data exchange platform, Xroad, enables data exchange between other databases. From the start, um, we integrated this uh, with the registry of the buildings. Also, every EPC that is issued is uh, bound to a building, and all EPCs are publicly available. This uh, solution uh, makes EPCs a tool that can in many ways. EPCs are used to measure the state of the building stock. Financial measures use EPCs to measure the energy efficiency improvements. And the final example is um, digital construction. The EPC database was uh, just a small step towards digitizing the whole uh, building life cycle. 
Many of the digital building blocks on our e-construction platform are already in place, but they are not connected yet still. So, for instance, the National Registry of Buildings, e-land registry, Estonian Land Board Geo Portal, etc. The e-construction platform form will help to improve the energy efficiency of buildings by providing more comprehensive data for planning, analysis and simulation. Thank you for your atten attention. Thank, thank you very much, uh, 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 Mr. Minister. Among other things, uh, highlighting the importance of efficiency in the uh, buildings. Uh, we have a lot of uh, data and statistics, but one of the most sobering data I heard from uh, Brian is that today in the world, two out of three uh, buildings built today they, they don't have any uh, building codes. This is, this is horrible news. So this uh, shows the room for improvement. Two out of three buildings constructed in the world today, they have no building codes or standards for efficiency. So there's a huge room for improvement, and I'm sure your country and your efforts could be a very good example. So from uh, uh, Finland to uh, neighbor uh, Estonia, from uh, uh, Estonia to another neighbor, Africa, so this is a, we believe in the IEA, we are all neighbors, uh, uh, Mr. Minister, uh, close neighbors or not, but we have now the our, uh, commissioner from African uh, Union. Uh, may I ask now African uh, Union uh, Commissioner for Energy and Infrastructure, Infrastructure Dr. Abanya Abu Zaid. Madam Commissioner, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Birol, and you are not, actually you are not very far off. Uh, uh, earlier uh, in the year, we, we signed a, a big agreement with Estonia uh, to roll out e-governance programs in, uh, in Africa. And we, uh, we had also the visit of Her Excellency, the, the President, I paid her a visit, and she's coming again to Africa. So we, we're, we're neighbors, but more than neighbors, we're also partners, and that's important. Um, Good morning, everyone, Excellencies. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, today, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about aviation. I uh, know it's uh, this is odd because we, we the topic today is energy efficiency. So, what is aviation? Africa has got to do with anything today. Okay. Uh, the year 2018 is the year of African integration. We launched, as you must have heard and seen, we launched the uh, African Free Trade Agreement. That's an agreement uh, to liberalize the trade within African countries. We talked about a market of more than one billion people. 50 countries have joined, and we're incredibly excited about this news. Uh, for free trade to work within Africa, we need transport. We need a product to exchange and to trade with our neighbors and brothers and sisters. So we need to industrialize, and to industrialize we need energy. And to transport our products we need aviation, which needs fuel. And for all of this to work, our people need to be connected digitally. And for digitalization to happen, we need energy again. So we turn and turn and turn, and every way we look, it's about energy. Now, in Africa, the rate of access to energy is 49%. And half of the energy that's being consumed is either unhealthy biomass or uh, firewood. In this data and age, this is unacceptable unacceptable not only for Africans, it's unacceptable for anybody to accept it for Africa. So we are also changing that. We are leaping forward in the continent in so many ways and in so many sectors. Digital transformation that's happening on the continent is a great success story for the whole continent. Our growth rates in uh, the different countries, 10 or 3 or 4 of the fastest growing economies in the whole world. So energy cannot be lagging behind. And as I said, in this interconnected world, and also interconnected through energy as much as digitalization, 
We want to make sure that we do it in an efficient manner. And the reason I picked aviation is that if you open this wonderful book that has been prepared by the IEA on the chapter of transport you find aviation, and it's very important again for our countries having so many landlocked countries and aviation is an important element that we have launched also this year, liberalizing the African air transport and, uh, and uh, the African skies. Now, back to energy efficiency. Um, if we measure, you know, the energy unit per GDP, uh, in, in things have improved uh, and the prices of energy have improved quite tremendously on the continent over the last years, like by 30%. But still, it's, the, it's three times higher than elsewhere in the world, and especially the OECD. We want to make sure that this, not only we have our people have access, but have access at the right and the fair price. And this will only happen if things are, happy, uh, are efficiently, uh, all the resources are efficiently used and all the ways I mean to use the resources are also efficient. That is why we're putting a lot of emphasis on energy efficiency. We have created the African Union, a commission in North, uh, based in Algiers. And uh, this energy commission has for purpose, among others, the energy efficiency element. And I'm very happy that over the past years, with, together with the IEA, we have been developing uh, statistics, data, and tools for energy efficiency in Africa, and also training Africans on energy efficiency tools. So back to the elements that were mentioned by the, uh, by the IEA regarding the training and the human element, also mentioned by His Excellency Minister of Finland. So the human element has to be put in the center, but also uh, uh, the, the, f to provide the human, uh, uh, our colleagues and our brothers and sisters with the right uh, uh, training and capacitation to use whatever tools that are put in place. Uh, the other angle that we are looking at uh, uh, for, the, for the energy efficiency, and I uh, was listening with great attention to both the presentations by Estonia and by, uh, uh, and by his uh, excellency also from uh, Finland, so both of them, is the innovation and the creativity. I did mention that the, the continent Africa is leaping when it comes to digital transformation. Uh, and I'm also very happy and excited that in Africa we are rolling out new business models using these new technologies. So uh, to ensure access, we allow, I mean, among, uh, other than the big projects for transmission and for generation, for distribution, we are looking at the mini grids and off grids. And increasingly, we are seeing the mini grids and off grids being used particularly for rural areas and for uh, uh, remote areas. Uh, now we do also see on the continent these mini grids uh, or these off grids are paid for using the mobile money, say for instance. And even now the regular citizen is becoming a producer of energy and selling energy to the neighbors. These are wonderful news. And, and the advent of technology is changing almost everything when it comes to energy distribution, energy usage, and. Uh, Again, creating new opportunities for the individuals, the private individuals, and, uh, uh, and not only the state uh, or the government as a producer of energy or a distributor of energy. And talking about distribution of energy, the other element we're looking at is our utilities. And, uh, and we want to make sure that the utility companies also are well equipped to deal with all of this. Because it's a whole completely new world that's opening up and the monopoly of the state Practically in our countries, this is, I mean, in Africa, this is the case, the monopoly of the state when it comes to either generation or uh, selling or distributing energy, this is changing ten thanks to the advent of new technology. If you have been in the room earlier uh, in the morning before we, uh, we start the session, there was a, there was a, a sondage, there was a survey uh, about the, uh, what would you do if you were Minister of Energy? Have you seen this? What were the two elements that were the highest, 25 and 29%? Sorry? No? No, no, no. Have you been, did you see what was on there? Sorry? Standards was high, and then followed by? Big data. Followed by big data, innovation using big data. And that this is, this is not, I'm not going to say it's the future. 
is the present. And we want to make sure that all of us, and especially in Africa where digital transformation is happening, that big data is rolled out also in the, in the, in the way we measure behavior, in the, in the way we measure the, the, the consumption of energy, the way we address it, the way we use it. And I think this was alluded to also by both of you, uh, uh, Excellencies. I can keep talking on and on about all of this, but in my world, because I'm in charge, Mr. Birol, I'm, I'm also in charge of all infrastructure and, uh, and tourism, but I'm not going to talk to you about tourism today, which also need aviation. Uh, it, 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 we cannot talk about energy in the absence of everything else that's happening around us. Uh, Energy is a human right. Energy is cooking, energy is housing, energy is aviation transportation, it's trade, it's industrialization. And all of this comes together and for all of it to function. To function well and to function also fairly, especially in, for us in the continent, we do need all these tools and we all need the, the knowledge and that's another reason for which we teamed up with the IEA uh, in May and some of you were there in the, in the meeting. We teamed up again uh, in addition to the work that we have been doing with the IEA through Africa, again to push forward the, 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 the agenda for energy access, for energy efficiency, for energy and gender, for energy and climate. So, uh, I do not wish to take more of your time, but I wish to thank you all for being here and for working with us in, uh, in making this world a better place, and it will only be a better, better place when Africa, you know, is a better place. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Commissioner. As uh, Madam Commissioner uh, mentioned, on uh, 25th of May uh, this uh, year, on the Africa Day, uh, African uh, Union, uh, Madam Commissioner, and the IEA, myself, signed an uh, MOU to have a strategic relationship with the uh, IEA work uh, on Africa, and we have uh, many good uh, events, programs, and the policy actions uh, to take uh, together. Looking forward to that, uh, Madam uh, uh, Commissioner. So. Uh, the, we heard from uh, uh, three different uh, perspectives from Finland, Estonia, and Africa. And uh, I would like to now to go to uh, Japan, a country which has been a, a, one of the definitely leaders and the champions of energy efficiency uh, for uh, many years. And uh, plus, uh, uh, Japan next year is going to host a very important uh, meeting, the G20. Uh, summit, and uh, I understood uh, from our Japanese colleagues that the energy efficiency uh, will take it is uh, important uh, place uh, for uh, that uh, meeting. Now uh, we are uh, very fortunate that uh, we have now today with us Mr. Hirofumi uh, Takinami, who has been very recently, uh, only uh, just a few days, as the Japan's uh, Vice Minister of Economy, Trade, and uh, Industry. Uh, uh, Mr. Minister, I thank you very much because I understood it is your first uh, visit outside of Japan at, at, at your capacity as the Minister. We thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister, for coming here and looking forward to uh, hearing you, Mr. Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Hiro Fumi Takinami, uh, Vice Minister of uh, Economy, Trade and Industry, uh, here representing the Japanese government. Um, I'm pleased to uh, attend this IEA uh, Global uh, Conference on e Energy Efficiency um, from a little bit different time zone uh, compared with other you know, speakers this morning. Um, and uh, let me extend my sincere gratitude to uh, Dr. Bro uh, and the member of the year for the hospitality granted for us. Um, today I'd like to introduce Japanese policy on improving uh, energy efficiency and share Japan, Japan, uh, Japan's vision for engagement with the important uh, uh, improvement of the global energy efficiency as chair of the G20 next year. No. Okay. Got it. 
So, first of all, uh, I would like to introduce Japan's history of energy efficiency. Uh, since experiencing the oil crisis in the 70s, Japan has made a great effort to improve energy efficiency in both public and private uh, sectors and successfully achieved in boosting economic growth and uh, reaching the highest efficiency level in the world at the same time. Uh, to be precise, uh, despite the fact that the Jap Japan's uh, GDP has increased uh, 2.6 times uh, since the oil crisis, the final energy consumption over there uh, has increased only the 1.2 times in the same period. This shows that every sector in Japan, especially home and office devices and the materials such as the heat insulators are subject of that program. Under the top uh, one program, uh, for example, uh, efficiencies of the regulated pro uh, products have made remarkable improvements. Uh, for example, uh, since uh, 2001, the fuel economy of the passenger vehicle has improved 70%, and the efficiency of the air conditioners has improved by 22%. You can see all these small numbers. <laughs> the Japanese government has also set a mid to long term energy efficiency target for operations for each industry and business sector, especially including the energy intensive industries such as iron, steel, petrochemical, cement, and paper. Currently, this program covers nearly 70% of the Japan's industry and businesses. Um, business sectors, uh, which help encourage these sectors to improve their energy efficiency further towards the, those goal, uh, targets. By continuously setting a uh, high efficiency target on companies' operations as well as their products, uh, Japan will maintain its status as a global top runner uh, in uh, both in energy efficiency and uh, in industry competitiveness. At the same time, Japan is challenging in an even more ambitious energy efficiency target, which is shown in the long-term energy supply and demand outlook toward 2030. In particular, by 2030, the Japanese government will endeavor to improve energy efficiency more radically by achieving reduction of the 50 million kiloliter of crude oil equivalent compared with the BAU business as usual case. This amount of improvement in energy efficiency is the same level as the historical uh, record uh, Japan made after the oil crisis, which means the certified improvement in energy efficiency. Japan will continue working toward this remarkable improvement, uh, which we call the second energy efficiency revolution, hopefully. Um, furthermore, it is very important uh, to ensure that the future energy efficiency policy corresponds to the change in the economy and the society. One example is to promote a joint effort or in energy efficiency between different companies. Uh, through a joint effort, companies are able to reach more ambitious energy efficient goals that would be impossible individually. Uh, there are many potential methods of cooperation between different com uh, companies. For example, as uh, this figure shows, um, two companies can put total, total efficiency by integrating company A's upstream process to uh, company B. Uh, the Japanese government is actually supporting this kind of joint action. Uh, for, the, for that purpose, uh, Japan has revised the act on the rational use of the energy this June. Uh, it, for the 40 years since the establishment of the Act, uh, it, it promoted the uh, effort of the energy efficiency improvement by each company through the requiring energy use reporting uh, for individual company. But the revised Act on the rational use of energy at this time allowed for the proper evaluation of the collective efficiency uh, improvement effort by a set of companies. Thus promoting the joint investment uh, for efficiency, uh, I myself have worked hard to realize that this amendment as the Chief Director of the Committee on uh, Economy and Industry in the Upper House, um, just before I assumed the uh, Vice Minister's position now. 
Um, I believe that this type of timely legal amendment can further accelerate the input, uh, improvement of the energy efficiency. So on the global uh, scale, energy efficiency is improving gradually. However, governments need to make a greater effort uh, to, uh, in order to achieve the SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals target of the doubling the energy efficiency improvement rate by 2030. Uh, further efforts are needed not only by the parties in attendance today, but also by all the people in the world. Uh, Japan is going to chair the G20 next year. As a part of that work, uh, we will hold the Energy and Environment Minister meeting uh, next June. Japan is planning to position uh, energy efficiency as one of the main agenda for the meeting. Uh, how can G20 country uh, address these issues? It will not uh, be easy to achieve these goals and, uh, and Japan cannot tackle it alone. By receiving the support of the IEA under the leadership of the Dr. Biro, uh, the Japanese government will make its best efforts to realize uh, further international cooperation for accelerating evidence-based efforts to improve energy efficiency. In conclusion, uh, both bilateral and multilateral uh, technological cooperation are necessary for accelerating the global improvement of the energy efficiency, and the Japanese government uh, will continue to provide support to the IEA, uh, which plays an important role uh, in enhancing the global cooperation. Again, I truly appreciate the opportunity to speak here, and I'm looking forward to fruitful discussion with the distinguished delegates. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister, uh, for your uh, great speech, uh, for the Japanese government putting a lot of emphasis on energy efficiency, especially for the G20 meeting. And uh, just to tell you that perhaps you can join me to thank Mr. Minister uh, once again, because he came here yesterday night and he is leaving back to Japan right after this session. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Thank you. Now we heard the, uh, the, uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Minister the uh, G20 plans and the role of energy efficiency for the Japanese G20 uh, next year. And uh, this year we also had a very important uh, G20, this time uh, uh, chaired by uh, Germany. And we are very fortunate to have uh, Mr. Thorsten Harden, who is the Director General for uh, Energy Policy in uh, German Minister of Economic Affairs. Uh, Mr. Haddon, we are very happy that uh, you found time to come here. We are looking forward to hear your views about Germany, another leader in energy efficiency, as well as renewable energy, but also the achievements we had in the G20 presidency. Please join me thank uh, Mr. Haddon. Mr. Haddon. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me, inviting us, inviting Germany and uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining this energy efficiency conference, which I think um, is not only very important, uh, it is now for the third time, but is simply necessary. It's simply necessary. I can remember then, uh, it was, I think, three years ago, uh, Fadi, when you organized a efficiency and renewables um, conference. Um, my main message was uh, we may need to make sure that energy efficiency and renewables will become friends and then stay friends. That is something which uh, may sound a little bit uh, odd at the moment uh, you hear it, but uh, if you dig into the details, and I will do a little bit, uh, you will see that this is a very, very important aspect because it is something where the attention of government is placed to where the attention of uh, money is placed to. Uh, just an example, very often uh, green bonds are only green if they include renewables and are not green if they are looking for energy efficiency. So it is a very important point. It is still valid, uh, but there is something else coming on the agenda right now, and that was mentioned many times, and I will a little bit uh, elaborate on that um, in order to perhaps continue the discussion, um, which is um, perfectly placed by uh, the IAA and, of course, also IPEG. 
Uh, Fadi Barol was uh, putting the three messages uh, on what the IEA is continuing to do in terms of platform, in terms of education, and um, in terms of finance. Uh, I will not elaborate on all the measures we do in Germany because uh, that would uh, take a little bit too long time and would perhaps not be so much of an interest, but there are two main uh, points we have to look at, and the one is uh, what we call energy efficiency networks, and they cover all the three aspects because you will then uh, place together companies or even individuals uh, and they do everything on exchange in terms of best practice, what they did in terms of financing, in terms of education and in terms that's a platform. So we've right now more than 200 uh, industrial networks and we'll continue to get that up to 500. And that is a very important um, part of the story of energy efficiency because that doesn't need uh, any pressure on industry, any pressure on individuals, simply learning from each other how to do it. So I can only advocate uh, that uh, energy efficiency networks to be further continued and to be brought into all over the world. And that was also a very important point uh, out of our Climate and Energy Action Plan and the German G20 presidency uh, to improve this energy efficiency networks establishment around the world. The other point is uh, that we in Germany decided uh, to auction energy efficiency projects. To auction energy efficiency projects, uh, and we now have notified that at the European Commission in terms of state aid, and they went, that went through. Uh, and we're all talking about auctions on renewables. Have you ever talked about in detail on auctions on energy efficiency? You haven't, I think. Uh, that is some new model uh, which we think is extremely helpful, uh, specifically if it comes to the financing aspect, because if you have an auction, then you have, a, I will not call it directly an asset class for energy efficiency, but some sort of an asset class of energy efficiency, and that is what we really, really need, because energy efficiency so far is not an asset class, and that is why the financial sector is not that much happy with energy efficiency projects compared to renewable projects, because that is an asset class. The main message uh, today uh, is a little bit negative, uh, sorry to say that, uh, but it will end up uh, being positive in terms of what our challenges and opportunities are. The point of negative uh, is that we have to realize that energy efficiency becomes more complicated. It really becomes more complicated for three reasons. The first reason is global developments uh, and uh, costs and therefore prices for energy going down. With all the success in renewables, uh, we very well know that prices are going down, 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 which is extremely good, which is extremely good. With taking really Paris as the goal, it means that we have to refrain from using fossils. I think we met very often elaborated on that. That means prices are going down from fossils. So if renewables prices are going down, fossils prices are going down, then the overall energy prices are going down. I think that is something, despite of where the oil price is right now, that is a tendency which has to go, oh, we can forget about Paris, uh, another story. But I think we all agree that we will not forget about Paris because we will not forget about the world where we are living and where our children would li like to live in. So if prices are going down, Energy efficiency is not at the heart of industry, it's not at the heart of individuals, it's not at the heart of investment. No, en energy prices, not so much a tendency to energy efficiency. Second point is that energy efficiency is complicated because we have it in production, meaning electricity production or production of heat or whatever. That is one type of efficiency. The other type of efficiency, and I was very glad that I heard that from all of uh, the panelists, is infrastructure. I think that is entering into the game as a new kind of energy efficiency, infrastructure. And then, of course, it's consumption. So we have those three areas of energy efficiency, production, infrastructure, consumption, meaning produce something, bring it to the customer and the customer to use it. And that is something where we can, of course, uh, collect the low-hanging fruits. And I'm very glad that Fatih Birol is always pointing out those low-hanging low fruits by using more efficient products like uh, refrigerators, like uh, air conditioners, uh, and, and, and. But as long as we not understand that it has to be a system efficiency which we have to address, we will run into the wrong direction. 
we were definitely running into the wrong direction. And I will make that clear at one example which goes along with electrification. We all know that the world is getting more electric because wind and PV, the very big, uh, big um, um, front runners of renewables, are producing electricity and not X or something else, so the world will be more electric. Yes, no doubt. In Germany right now, and I think that is uh, valid in many other countries around the world, we have only, despite perhaps, of course, of the northern countries due to water power and other uh, issues, we have only 20% of our energy demand from electricity right now, so 80% is something different. If we only look on electricity, we forget about the 80%. Shouldn't do that. If we look on to, uh, to electricity, we also have to see what electricity are we talking about. Are we talking about electricity is good? Then we also talk about coal-fired electricity is good. That's not the case. We're looking for CO2-free electricity. In case of Germany, it's renewables only. In other countries, it's also nuclear. But it must be CO2-free electricity. And if you look to the electricity demand by electrification, we see that the velocity of getting CO2-free electricity produced, transported, and consumed is not as fast as the world would like to see the electrification. Then, of course, you have a lot of uh, applications which are simply inefficient if you do electrify them. If you electrify a car, then you reduce um, um, energy demand because you have a more efficient uh, uh, car by, uh, compared to a combustion engine. If you replace the combustion engine on a container ship leaving Shanghai and entering into Europe, that may be a different story. That may be a complete different story. And that is what I mean with uh, system integration. First of all, you have to look to the application, of course, taking the point electrification like a, uh, in a car. Then you have to look how do you get the electricity produced and transported. And then you have to look how can you consume the electricity. If the whole system gets less efficient with an electric application, then we should go a different way. And that is something I uh, really would like to advocate that uh, we all look to that and that the IAA also looks into that. I think you have done, uh, Fadi, an extremely good report with the various sectors, with the various countries, with the very big countries like China and India. If they don't uh, go the efficiency way, we can almost do what we want in the world. Africa, of course, coming up, getting hopefully all the people uh, powered um, by energy, but if we don't use this system approach, if we don't use this system approach, we will end up in a very simple perspective. And the simple perspective is that electricity is good, change everything to electricity, and hopefully we'll get the CO2-free electricity. And if not, so what? And that's the, the big problem uh, about that. And when I was attending the G20 energy ministers meeting in, in Bariloche in Argentina, the, the G7 in Halifax, uh, just the Belt and Road Initiative, the energy ministers meeting in, uh, in, in Sushu last uh, week. It, it seems that the only solution now is to electrify the world. And I'm very concerned about that with this approach, we will not really point on the need of energy efficiency, but we will just look on electricity, and then something happens like it is in Germany right now. We say there is excess energy. There is a lot of wind. So just use it. Don't take care of energy efficiency, because it's there. It's excess. Can you imagine if this continues? Uh, because it's only excess in a very small region where you cannot transport this electricity to the customer because you haven't thought about energy infrastructure. So again, the main message uh, today is, if we are not looking on system energy efficiency, we are most probably on the wrong pathway. And so we have to do both things together, picking the low-hanging fruits by putting standards in place, looking at uh, um, applications like um, air conditioners to make them more efficient, when building new homes, to have a standard in place when you build it and not after you have built it, and, 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 but together to do that with the system um, approach of energy efficiency. I think the IA is on the, wrong, uh, on the right way. 
Thank you. Absolutely on the right man. You know, you know I, I do that very often to see whether you are still listening. Um, and uh, on the very right way. But there is a step forward. I would like to see FATI together with the three approaches, a fourth one. And that comes out of our G20 presidency in Germany. We have heavily discussed uh, the question, do we need an international strong voice for energy? Not only a voice, but also uh, a uh, strong activity for energy. And we call that energy, uh, energy efficiency hub. And we took it out of the G20, uh, gave it to the IEA together with IP to build up that hub. And I feel that uh, it is now time to make this hub reality, that countries join together, and I would like to see the IAA taking over that responsibility of building that hub and making it clear to the world uh, that there are renewables and energy efficiency, and I'll come back to the very first beginning, which have to go together as uh, friends and not beating each other because the renewables say uh, we are so big you don't need to take care of using us. Just use us, whatever you would like to do. And I hope that uh, Fadi, the IAA, will take that up uh, as you've done that, but bring it to life uh, in the next year. We will be partners in that, and I think also many other countries around the world. And uh, perhaps, uh, Mr. Taginami, we will also discuss it uh, in the uh, G20 uh, group uh, to see how the progress was made from uh, our energy and climate action plan. So thank you very much again for organizing the third conference. I think it's a big step forward uh, and uh, perhaps in the next year we will see an energy efficiency hub conference uh, and we will certainly be very happy to join that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harden. To, it was great to hear your uh, views uh, about the, uh, Germany's uh, emphasis on energy efficiency, uh, your advice, and it is also very relieving that you agree with the 250 people here that IE is in the right way, so it is very good to hear that. <laughs> and uh, now, if you allow me, I want to ask one single question to our panelists to understand uh, a bit more uh, what uh, their messages are for all of us uh, here based on their experiences. Perhaps I can start with, the, uh, with Finland, uh, Mr. Minister. Uh, you have a government, you have a cabinet, and when you want to push an energy efficiency policy, uh, legislation and so on, what kind of difficulties uh, you are facing with your perhaps uh, fellow uh, ministers, with your bureaucracy, with the, with the, uh, with the perhaps the private sector. What are the challenges you are facing when you push forward an energy efficiency policy if you, of course, uh, face any? Thank you. I guess everyone of, of us face sometimes difficulties. And actually, uh, Thorsten mentioned one important one. Usually when we are working, for example, with industries or municipalities, the investments are done to improve the productivity or increase the production. And uh, industries, they don't pay so much attention, for example, the reduction of uh, energy costs. So the investments in energy efficiency are uh, very uh, quickly paid back. They are not the core business of uh, the company. And Thorsten mentioned that if the price of energy is getting down, they are less and less in the core business because the savings are not that uh, um, remarkable and uh, though the investment will anyway pay back quickly, it's not the focus of. And uh, we try to, uh, with this uh, agreement and auditing system, to help companies to pay more attention in these uh, improvements, improvements that they can achieve in energy efficiency with different uh, ways. That's uh, one thing that uh, we have to continue. But um, I would also like to raise one very important uh, issue about the, uh, how we could improve energy efficiency. 
Actually, I was on Monday in Yokohama, Japan, <laughs> in the World Circular Economy Forum, uh, arranged together with Japan and Finland. And um, just one example. You all use every now and then aluminium cans for drinking soda or something else. Uh, if the aluminium cans are primary aluminium or recycled aluminium, there's huge difference between the electricity consumption and energy efficiency. So in Finland we have deposit on each aluminium can that is sold to customers. So they will uh, bring them back to the supermarkets to get the deposit back. And the recycling rate is about 79%, uh, 97% or something. And the uh, energy efficiency in recycled aluminium is about 90% higher than the primary aluminium production. So this circular economy promotion is one way to improve the systemic energy efficiency in our societies and economies. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. You also mentioned the, uh, the role of industry in this uh, 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 picture, and uh, right after this session, we will have uh, uh, CEOs, executives of the uh, energy industry, and a topic that we are going to discuss with them after, right after this session to hear uh, their perspectives and what do they think about the governments. So this, this is here, uh, their views, are the governments uh, working good enough to provide the investment framework so that the, 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 the energy industry uh, makes the necessary steps in uh, that direction. Thank you very much uh, for that. Now, moving to the uh, uh, issue of digitalization, uh, Mr. Minister. So this is uh, uh, when we read the papers, uh, when we uh, hear, uh, go to conferences, we, your country's name and digitalization is often uh, pronounced together. What kind of concrete energy efficiency gains uh, you register in your country as a result of uh, digitalization efforts? Many thanks for this uh, question. Um, Estonia puts lots of emphasis on um, the building information uh, modeling, uh, or so-called uh, BIM. Uh, and um, what this allows us to do is to, um, to focus on the entire uh, building life cycle, uh, from uh, the design, uh, construction, uh, maintenance, and, and later on uh, demolishing. And uh, what it also allows us to do is to simulate um, uh, energy performance of uh, materials and components uh, so that uh, we can do this uh, from the very early on uh, for the design of the new building, but also for the uh, refurbishments. So I think uh, this is very important, and, and with this uh, project we are, we are um, moving um, uh, with, a, with a rapid pace. This is a concrete example from Mr. Henry. Excellent. Excellent. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Minister. Uh, moving to Africa again, uh, uh, Madam Commissioner. Uh, now, general understanding is energy efficiency, energy saving is an issue for the uh, rich countries uh, who use a lot of energy to save it. But uh, we know that, as you have rightly mentioned, in Africa, in fact, uh, there is a need for uh, more energy for the people who have no access uh, to electricity using a lot of uh, uh, traditional biomass uh, for uh, cooking. Uh, what do you think, what is the place of energy efficiency in the minds of the policy makers in Africa, oh, Madam Commissioner? I link this, thank you, Mr. Birol. I, I, I think I'll link this to your very first question about the challenges that we face. In the case of uh, Africa, the actual challenge is that uh, Africa is not monolithic. I know people mention Africa, but we have more than 50 countries in Africa. Each one of them has a different story when it has a different story, and has a different story also when it comes to energy. So. In my own country, for instance, uh, Egypt, well, this is a country of 100%, uh, uh, almost 99%, 100% access. So access is not the issue. But these are all systems. And uh, uh, in terms of energy efficiency, there's a lot to be, to be done. 
I'm very happy that now in Egypt we see, for instance, smart meters where they introduce a new, uh, a new uh, elements and for energy efficiency. That's fine. But uh, we also have countries with a rate of access that is 19, 15%. That's a different story. So before we get into access, uh, before we get into efficiency, we, the main element and the main challenge is access. But the good, uh, 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 the good thing about this is in our countries, even those who have very low access to energy, they are in, in the way we are we are doing it. We're trying to do it in a smart way. Smart way, like well thought of, but also smart using digitalization. And I will give the example, for instance, of Kenya. Kenya now we do have, uh, thanks to some uh, uh, experiments with, uh, with, uh, with Germany and other partners, we have in the, I mentioned the off-grids and the uh, many grids paid for with mobile money using renewable energy. So it's, the, it's done in, a, in, a, in an innovative, creative way and in efficient, in an efficient manner. Uh, so, the actual challenge in Africa is that every situation, every country has a different story and has different needs and uh, therefore our response when it comes to both access to efficient, sustainable energy has to be taken. Uh, and nevertheless, the, 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 the continent keeps producing excellent examples of innovative and creative ways of dealing with the situation and all those with uh, old, uh, older systems are doing what they can as well to accelerate the efficiency or to improve the efficiency of the systems. Excellent. In fact, this is the, an area that we are uh, to, working together with the African uh, Union, AFRIC and uh, others how we can uh, help to build an energy infrastructure which is uh, energy efficient so that the, some of the uh, mistakes some other countries made, we learn uh, from that and again the, uh, the applying the best practice and best policies. Uh, let me turn to Japan, uh, uh, Mr. Vice Minister. Uh, you kindly mentioned that the Japan uh, chose uh, energy efficiency as one of the key topics for your G20 presidency. Uh, what was the idea behind it? Why did you choose uh, that topic uh, for, as one of the key topics uh, for your uh, G20 presidency? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Biro. Um, that's a great question from IEA on right way. <laughs> and, uh, the answer is very kind of straightforward. Uh, energy efficiency is the, you know, uh, can contribute to the three E's uh, globally, uh, namely the energy, uh, security, economic growth, and the environment. And, uh, um, you know, uh, energy efficiency in that sense is, the, you know, the first fuel to consider the energy mix. And uh, G20 covers 80% of the global energy consumption and have the responsibility uh, to achieve the global three E's. So um, uh, that's the reason that we, uh, Japan chose the energy efficiency is an important uh, discussion item uh, for the G20 uh, next, year, uh, uh, next June. And uh, since we are chair on the G20, so we are uh, you know, looking forward, uh, you know, we, are, well, we would like to uh, take a lead in the discussion. And uh, for that, uh, we need the help from the IEA and the leadership of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. We were, uh, in fact, last week, uh, I was also in Japan. So we were all in Japan last week, I have the feeling. I was in, in Nagoya and in Tokyo. That Japan also chose another very important topic uh, for the G20 presidency, which is the hydrogen energy. So uh, we were uh, uh, honored by the, uh, uh, the choice of Japanese uh, uh, presidency to support the G20 uh, presence of Japan, both for hydrogen energy as well as energy efficiency. This is a great honor for us, and we will do our best uh, to uh, serve the G20 countries under the leadership of Japan, uh, Mr. Minister. Thank you very much. So uh, my uh, last question is, uh, Mr. Harden. So uh, uh, you uh, uh, mentioned, uh, uh, Torsten, a uh, very important point. The, uh, the as a result of the uh, achievement uh, Germany and the other have uh, uh, registered, uh, we have a, a problem, 
normally achievements give a, a victory, but we have a problem. Namely, as a result of the lower uh, renewable energy prices, uh, the electric prices are lower, and this may be a challenge for the energy efficiency improvements. Uh, how do you see it? How can we uh, solve this uh, very challenge in front of us? Because, as you rightly mentioned, the renewables and energy efficiency should be, in theory, uh, good friends. If not, as Madam Commissioner mentioned, mentions, uh, sister or brothers. Uh, but we see a problem there. How can we uh, overcome that problem? I think there is only one way to go, uh, and we are tackling a very important and a very problematic uh, issue, which is CO2. That was Paris. That uh, was the beginning of the energy uh, transition in many countries, and that will lead us to either if we have a world which is worth to live in or not. And as long as we cannot agree worldwide that this CO2 has to get a price, we will never ever reach the point uh, that economies in the world would refrain from using cheap fossils. Very simple. And if this uh, would be inserted, then I think you can, uh, not easily, but then you can uh, differentiate between uh, CO2 free electricity, being renewables, CO2 intensive electricity or heat. If this gets a higher price, then we will see a very simple movement. And this is that we will never ever get the current energy demand fulfilled by all the renewables if we don't reduce it dramatically, specifically with the big countries, uh, China, India, and upcoming countries like in, in Africa, if they are not from the very beginning integrate uh, into their development uh, the lowest use of energy, we will have no chance, no chance whatsoever to fill the whole energy demand with renewables. I think that's the only way to go. It's a long way to go. I know those COP dis uh, discussions, um, but it's the only one. Uh, and I think IA could play a very important role to always point uh, on that uh, aspect. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Thorsten. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have heard uh, very upbeat uh, 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 statements uh, from uh, governments, uh, policy makers. This is very good news, the determination of our governments uh, uh, from uh, different perspectives, uh, different corners of the uh, world. But uh, when we look at some numbers, which we do at the uh, yeah, some numbers are not uh, very encouraging. i give you one number. While uh, we have, as uh, Torres and the other colleagues mentioned, the, the, we have, there is a Paris uh, goal. There is a recently published IPCC report talking about the 1.5 degrees and immediate decline of the CO2 emissions. When we look at the numbers, we have at the IEA, as you all know, we have all the energy data, all the energy data at our uh, fingertips. When we look at the first nine months of this year, we see another increase of the CO2 emissions, global CO2 emissions. So the reports, targets are see, uh, expecting an immediate decline of the emissions but 17 was an increase and 18 is another increase. There's a big disconnect between the perceptions, expectations, what is happening in the real life. And when we look at the reasons why it is happening, one of the key reasons, perhaps the most important reason, is energy efficiency improvements are slowing down worldwide for many uh, reasons. So it is the very reason IEA is, is pushing the energy efficiency very strongly and we'll be pushing even more now. Uh, this event itself, our uh, very ambitious program, putting the resources there, and I would like to thank many of the governments here to support the IEA in our clean energy transition programs, supporting many countries around the world to put the right energy efficiency uh, 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 policies. And uh, perhaps I finish. Uh, uh, by saying that uh, you know that we have nicknamed the energy efficiency as the first fuel. With the, uh, with the permission of uh, Brian, I am changing this, Brian. From the first fuel, 
we are going to consider energy efficiency as of now a very first field uh, for us giving all the challenges. I thank you very much and we are going to have another session right after this, after the cafe break, uh, uh, for the business perspectives which will be chaired by the uh, IEA governing board uh, chair, Mr. Uh, Noe van Hust. And once again across the foyer, uh, please visit our uh, new uh, uh, energy efficiency exchange platform. Thank you very much to all the ministers and all the colleagues. Thank you very much.